to the Potter's House. We're excited that you're here and excited for what God's going to do. Excited to have our pastor back in the pulpit today to share the word with us. It's going to be good. I'm a little nervous because I used them as my object lessons. What's about to happen today? But Uh no, I'm just kidding. (laughs) No, we're glad you're here today. Today, our Hebrew word for praise is going to be zamar. It's going to come up behind me, I believe, I hope. On the words for praise. All right. And it means to pluck the strings of an instrument, to sing, to praise. A musical word which is largely involved with joyful expressions of music and with musical instruments. So zamar is one word for praise. And we see in the Hebrew language there's seven main words for praise. And I love that it's only one that has to do with musical instruments. Because what we do here on Sundays is only a portion of what worship really is. Because worship is really about a heart that reverences, that adores, that loves God. It's us loving him back. In 1 John, it says, I love the one who first loved me. And that's worship. It's just loving him back. And we can live a life of loving him back. We can sing in our cars. We can uh, sing as we're washing dishes and we're going throughout our day, as we're you know, preparing to study, as we're walking to class on campus. We can be worshiping and we can be praising God in our hearts can be just loving him back for what he's done. It's so much more than just a musical instrument releasing songs of praise. And Psalms 150 says, Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. This is Zamar. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with strings, uh, with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So are you breathing? then let's get praising. Amen. (laughs) He's worthy. He's worthy of our praise. So Lord, today we love you so much. And with every single breath in our being, we sing the praises of God with these instruments today, with our voices, with our clapping hands, with our dancing feet. We purpose in our heart to praise the Lord, for you are worthy of our praise. And even as Zamar means a joyful celebration, God, we are filled with joy in your presence. In fact, your word says that in your presence there is fullness of joy. And so today we come joyfully celebrating the goodness of our God, your excellent greatness. You are worthy of our praise. You deserve our love. You deserve our adoration. You deserve, God, our celebration of you, our hand clap, our lifting of our hands, our song, our dance. You deserve all the honor, all of the glory. And all of the worship today. We love you, Lord, with all of our hearts. And today we worship like no one else is watching but you. We don't look to the left or to the right, Father God, but we look directly to your face. And we sing our songs to your heart. O worthy one, in Jesus' name, amen.
Oh, 
this morning in the beauty of your holiness we worship this morning in the beauty of your holiness there's nobody like you there's nobody like you jar at your feet. Break the jar at your feet. We lift our face to the sun. We lift our face to the sun. We gaze at the Holy One. You're beautiful. We lift our face to the sun. We lift up the Holy One. You're beautiful, our Lord. Oh, 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 oh. You're beautiful. Oh, oh, oh. You said we're two or more gathered in your name. 
you are there in their midst. We don't take it lightly. We don't see it as a small thing. But here, in this moment, in this place, we stand in the presence of I am that I am. We recognize and we acknowledge the presence of the star-breathing God, of the I am that I am. And we worship this morning in the beauty of your holiness. Because Lord, you
Breathe upon it, Holy Spirit, blow the spark into a
worship you, Lord. You are our only desire. You are our only desire, Jesus. We welcome you. We worship you, Jesus. Mm. God, we worship you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord would say this morning that I inhabit the praises of my people. And I'm in your midst this day, saith the Lord. You are a treasure to me. And I love you so much, saith the Lord. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Good morning, everybody. And how are you this morning? Blessings. We'd love to welcome you if you're visiting for the first time. Um, and if you're a regular attender, welcome too. If you'd kindly sign the attendance pad that goes by you, that would be great. Um, also this morning, um, we have our Power of Dad team out in the foyer, and um, they are taking the, uh, donations this morning. And if you'd like to stop out there and give a donation, anything over five, you get this awesome-looking um, uh, sports class. So, and what an awesome ministry to minister to our young men, young boys, mentor them. Our hospitality team's going to come forward this morning, but before we take our offering, let's all stand, and we're going to do our proclamation this morning. So help me out. <laughs> Are we ready? Yeah. <laughs> okay. As we give our tithes and offerings, we are believing for, for interest in income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, healing and divine health, gift and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, debts demolished, royalties received, scholarships and grants, jobs promotions, the devourer rebuked, souls and more souls, and the windows of heaven open according to your word, in Jesus' name, hallelujah. Woo. <laughs> oh, we serve an awesome God. Father God, we thank you this morning. Lord, we are so blessed. We are so blessed. And our hearts is always are open and joyful to give, to further the kingdom. And again, we thank you so much for your love, Jesus. And all God's family said. Amen. 
Good morning and welcome to the Potter's House. We are so thankful you've come today to learn, grow, and connect with each other. Another great way to learn and grow is on Wednesday night, and we have something for the whole family. Word club for our little ones, a great youth group, and three adult classes. Check out the classes at the Connection Center. Everything begins at 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday nights. Our food pantry is Sunday, September 15th. This is a wonderful outreach to our community. Thank you, church family, for helping to provide food for anyone who might need a little extra help. Also, let's remember to continue to pray for our monthly outreach to our community. This month, we are praying for the teachers and the staff at Mount Pleasant Middle School. A catered lunch from Texas Roadhouse is provided, and we encourage and bless the teachers and staff for their service to our community. Together, we're making a difference. Our family service will be Sunday, September 29th, and this is a wonderful time when we are all together in the main sanctuary. That means children from kindergarten all the way up to youth join us for adult service. We also have water baptisms on Sunday, September 29th. If you have been considering getting baptized, please be sure to pick up a form at the Connection Center or online at our website. This is a great celebration of our faith of Jesus Christ. Forms are due by September 23rd. Let's rejoice together. The journey is coming. The Christmas journey is picking up momentum and we invite you to some very important gatherings coming up. Everyone is invited to the workday on Saturday, September 21st from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. We have physical work and spiritual work to be done. During our first workday, we also invite those who would like to come and pray to meet at 9 a.m. I can hardly wait to see the sets going up, the paths being formed, and the joy in bringing the journey to the community. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your theatrical <laughs> skills, desire to help, and all you want to be, whether you can act or not. We invite you everyone to the Christmas Journey casting call on Sunday, October 6th at 2 p.m. in the sanctuary. Yes, I understand that we have parts with a few lines, some with many lines, and some with no lines at all. The Christmas Journey cast will have something for everyone. Information sheets will be available at the special table next Sunday in the foyer. I understand I've already been considered as one of the wise men. I guess that would be like <laughs> typecasting, right? Oh, Jody. <laughs> Be watching next week for casting sheets and information at the special table in the foyer. This is going to be sure a great event for this community. Yeah, I can see that, though. Jody the wise man. It's like what my kids call me at home. <laughs> Casting call Sunday, October 6th at 2 p.m. We still have two more wise men positions available. Mm, maybe three. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to follow that stuff, right? <laughs> just so many powerful things going on and just excited to be a part of the Potter's House and the opportunities that are here. And so encourage you. I think Jen's out in the foyer even today. She'll be at the table, I think. I'm looking for Jen here somewhere. Yeah. So you can even find out more information back there from her uh, with what's going on there. This year we're going to be one of the churches that hosts the homeless shelter, so there's going to be opportunities for us to serve in that capacity as well. Just so many cool things going on. And uh, tomorrow night's a Power of Dad uh, community gathering time. And if you know people that maybe have young people and they want to know more about Power of Dad, send them tomorrow night. We're going to have some refreshments here and kind of share with them what Power of Dad is as we get ready to launch in uh, October. Another cool opportunity, Odyssey School is letting Power of Dad come in every Friday for eight weeks. And we're going to be able to minister to the young men there at Odyssey at the school. Isn't that cool? Michael McCreary helped make that happen and bring that about. It's just powerful what God is, what God is doing, the doors he's opening. So, well, why don't you stand up and greet one another and say, I'm blessed to see you here today. I am a guest speaker, just so you know. Uh, Prophet Matt was uh, preached one Sunday, and then uh, Pastor Nikki the last two, and uh, one of the young guys came up to me, and they said, Pastor Ron, we didn't miss anything while you were gone. I went, praise God. That was a, it, was a, it was a compliment. That was a good word. It was a good word. Uh, so praise God. Hey, funny, I see Doug in the back, Doug Carey, my dear friend, and I uh, remember we had Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames, and we needed some other cast members. This kind of going to tie in here. 
needed some other cast members. I said to Doug, I said, Doug, there's parts that nobody has to talk in. So I, I convinced him to come. He ended up with one of the major roles talking. <laughs> so don't believe him when they say there's, there's no lines. You may end up with lines. So. <laughs> Didn't mean to scare anybody away, Jen, but <laughs> it's going to be such an incredible opportunity. It's like God just kind of divinely set it up because the weekend before is the parade uh, downtown in the downtown uh, Christmas celebration where we're going to be able to hand out all kinds of tickets to families about the next weekend, the journey that's going to be there. And obviously we're going to do a bunch of promotion before that, but it's just a beautiful setup for us to be able to impact a lot of people with a powerful presentation of the gospel as they walk through the journey and uh, we're, we're able to, as a body, to love on people as they come. So encourage everybody to be a part. Uh, everybody that's got breath, praise the Lord. Everybody that's got a part, be part of the Christmas journey. Amen. Well, next Sunday, uh, Carl and I, all of you know, we both, uh, one of the brothers in Africa said to me, he said, man, you and your wife had a division of labor. She went to northern Canada, and then I was in Nigeria at the same time. And so next week, we're going to show some, uh, some slides from there, give you a little update on what took place. Both trips were just absolutely powerful. And I want you to catch a vision that whenever we go out, Fred and Denise go out at times, and they hold a camp meeting here, but they also go and preach at camp meetings and things like that. It's us together as a body going out. Your prayers, your support help us together as a body to reach out to the nations. And thank you for uh, having a heart for the nations. We're committed to our area, our region, but also God's called us to disciple the nations. So just want to just, again, just make a statement. We just really appreciate the heart of this body. So. Go with me to Exodus 33 this morning, and uh, we're going to begin to take a look at some scriptures here together. Exodus 33, we've been in this uh, journey together. Uh, called Presence Led Life, and we're going to continue on. We're going to move into hosting the presence and talk about David's tabernacle. Had the privilege uh, last weekend, Sunday night, Monday, and Tuesday, to uh, preach a camp meeting in uh, Beaverton at where Pastor Troy is at Cedar River, River Chapel, and he is doing a fabulous job there uh, as the pastor there, and their team is growing. Uh, really felt the life of God in the midst of that congregation, and so again, uh, just a, a neat, neat opportunity of sending people out and then making a difference for Jesus as well. So, well, let's look here this morning, Exodus 33. This has been our theme text, 13 through 16. Wow. 13 through 16. Now, therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight except you go with us? So we will be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. And again, this has been a kind of our theme text Moses says that we're not going to go, God, unless you go. A presence-led life. In Exodus 40, you see where they would set up the tabernacle. They would stay there until the tabernacle was broke down. And then when the tabernacle, the cloud, the fire moved, then they would move. But it was a picture of this present-led life. The Old Testament is in types what is a reality to us in the New Testament. And so those are types and shadows of us being believers who follow the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 14, as many uh, as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons, the mature ones of God. So we're to be people that are following the presence of God, following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. How many know that's a pretty exciting life? It really is. So we were worshiping today. I just thought, how blessed we are to know God. You know, every one of you here, you somehow you encountered God, whether God brought somebody into your life, however it happened, but you realize how blessed you are that you know God, that you have a relationship with God. Uh, never take it for granted. Never take it for granted. And so we've been talking about this. We've talked about how God always has always wanted to dwell and tabernacle with people. We looked at the Garden of Eden. We talked about the Tabernacle of Moses. Today we'll begin to look at David, the Tabernacle of David. 
the temple of Solomon, Jesus himself became as a, as a tabernacle. Then the church, and that's where we'll go as we move into October. We're going to move into the book of Ephesians. We're going to look at the church as the temple that's the carrier of the presence in our generation. The Bible says in Timothy that the church is the pillar of truth. If the church doesn't uphold truth, we're in trouble. And the church is the pillar of truth. We're the temple of God. We're the carriers of the presence of the Lord, individually and then corporately as the body. So we're going we're to look at that as we move into October. We're going to actually walk through the book of Ephesians together. So we've been talking here out of the book of Samuel, and you can turn there if you will. We've been talking out of the book of Samuel. Go to 1 Samuel chapter, uh, I think it's like 9 is where I want to start, or 10. I'll, I'll figure it out here in just a minute. But we've been talking... We've been walking through Samuel because we've been comparing Saul and David. That's been our comparison. Saul being led by a lot of things, and we can be led by a lot of things. And then we've compared that with David, who we've, we've watched over and over, who was led by God. Though there's times in David's life where he wasn't led by the presence, right? I mean, there's times that he stumbled along the way, and I hope that encourages you. These are real people who were purposing to walk with God. And you may stumble along your way as you're purposing to let God lead your life, but learn from that. I love what John Maxwell says, when you fall, he said, pick something up when you get up. He, in his book, Failing Forward, it's, it's learn a lesson, learn how to be more sensitive to the Holy Spirit, learn the voice of the Holy Spirit even more, more accurately as we walk with him. And so we've talked about David and, and, and Saul and, and Samuel in this relationship. We talked about how Saul was led by impatience. Remember that? We talked about impatience. He was, it actually ended up causing him to miss his destiny. He was to wait for Samuel. He got impatient, and it says he forced himself. Literally, he, he pushed himself past what he knew was right. Uh, he, he led himself. The impatience led him instead of the presence of God. And we see where he was led by impatience. And David, at times when he had opportunity to kill Saul, what did he do? He said, God will be the one that puts me in, in as king. He was patient. He was willing to wait on the Lord's timing. And boy, this is huge. This is huge for us because many of us can hear a word from the Lord, and if it doesn't happen in our timetable, we got plan B, C, D, all the way through the alphabet that we can try to generate and make it happen. And I'll tell you what, learning from experience... Those don't work. They don't work. They end up becoming Ishmael's. They end up becoming albatrosses around your neck that you have to clean up after the fact. So it pays to be patient with the Lord. And we, we, we talked about patience out of James even that day. And we talked about the fear of man, how the fear of man drove Saul. And in David's case, again, we see him secure in the Father. And we're going to talk some about that today. We saw how emotions led Saul, he was, uh, and this was one of the statements I shared, an uncontrolled tongue and uncontrolled emotions lead to instability and destruction. An uncontrolled tongue and uncontrolled emotions will lead to instability within your life, and eventually they will, it will lead to destruction. We see it in the life of Saul. He ends up, he's, uh, he's going to kill David, he's angry with David, then David's, he finds out David spares him, then he likes David. Then then uh, David, he gets angry at David again, he hunts him again, then he likes David after David shows him kindness. He's, he's like this. He, he says, no medians can be in the land, then, we end, then he ends up what? Going to a medium. I mean, he's unstable because his emotions, it's how he's feeling, is what's controlling and what's leading him. You will have an unstable life. I will have an unstable life. I will have a life that leads to a lot of hardship if I let my emotions run me. If I let my emotions run me, and, we, and we, we saw that. Then we talked about how he was led by circumstances. Go with me, if you will, to 1 Samuel chapter 9. I want to look at 19 through 21. Pastor Nikki shared the last two messages, and hers with the idea of keys to the presence-led life. She said, he can't lead you if you won't listen. I mean, just some great one-liners. He can't lead you if you keep trying to lead him. It's kind of like with a dance. You know, I mean, if you don't, if you don't flow, you got a war going on in the dance. It's how I dance. It's a war going on with myself, nobody else. All right. So that, that whole idea there. Then she said, he can't lead you if you won't go. If you know the way. I, I love what Brother Hagen used to say. He said, a parked car can't be steered. So if that car isn't going, it can't be steered. And if we won't go, God can't lead us. 
He just can't lead us. We're going to sit and park, and uh, that'll be it. Then last week, <laughs> she, what does our response reveal? Our response reveals what we reverence and rely on. Wow, another great, just powerful one-liner. How we respond reveals what we reverence and what we're relying on, what we're relying on. Reverence and reliance grow from relationship, which comes, or gr grow from revelation, which comes from relationship. Just again, some great practical points, powerful insights on being presence-led. I, I texted Nikki the other day, I said I was questioning whether the anointing was strong on the message, but when she came up with four R's, that was over. I knew the anointing was powerful at that point, you know. I know, I know, because we joke about this all the time, and I could tell when she was preaching, she, she did not want to look at me because we'd both have started laughing when she went to the four hours, so it's kind of, kind of funny. I want to look here today, and I don't know how far we'll get. Uh, I want to get to the Tabernacle of David, but I really, when I was in Africa, God really put this thing strong on my heart about Saul and the insecurity inside of Saul. So I want to start there today, and then we'll move from there. But even as I share this, I want to take a few moments and minister into it before we move on into the tabernacle of David. And let's just go into the scriptures, and I'll share with you what I was sensing from Jesus. So 1 Samuel 9, 19 through 21. Samuel answered Saul and said, I am, a, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for you shall eat with me today. And tomorrow I will let you go and will tell you all that is in your heart. But as for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not be anxious about them, for they have been found. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on you and on all your father's house? And Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you speak like this to me? I want us to see here there's insecurity even as God is purposing to call him. He, he looks at himself and he sees himself as little here. I'm from a small tribe. Why would you speak this way to me? And now if you go to chapter 10, 20 through 24, we see this with, with Saul again. And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was chosen. Let you get there, 1 Samuel 10, 20, and now 21. When he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was chosen. And Saul, the son of Kish, was chosen. But when they sought him, he could not be found. Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, Has the man come here yet? And the Lord answered, There he is, hidden among the equipment. So they ran and brought him from there, and when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to all the people, do you, see, do you see him whom the Lord has chosen, that there's no one like him among all the people? So all the people shouted and said, long live the king. The word here, this idea of hiding himself, it meant to withdraw. So Saul is called, Samuel says, I want you to come. He says, I'm why would you speak this way to me? Then when, when, the, when the event happens where he's going to be anointed, where do we find him? We find him withdrawing and hiding himself. There's an insecurity in this man. Yet if you look at it, naturally he has everything you would think that would give a man confidence. He was taller. He was handsome. He had all the natural attributes to be somebody with incredible security but he was incredibly insecure. And if you look at the life of Saul, you see an insecure man who is led with an addiction for the praise of people. Out of his insecurity, he is driven to get affirmation from people. He's like a little boy saying, Daddy, say I matter. Say I'm significant. Say I'm important. Now go with me to 1 Samuel, I think it's 15, yeah, verse 27 through 30. This portion of Scripture breaks your heart. Samuel has just spoken to Saul and said, 
the kingdom is, is taken from you because he had rejected the leadership of the Lord. And in verse 27 of 1 Samuel 15, And as Samuel turned around to go away, Saul seized the edge of his robe, and it tore. So Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and, and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent, for he is not a man that he should, not relent, that he should relent. Then, David, then he said, Saul, I have sinned, yet honor me now, please, before the elders of my people and before Israel. And return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. He's begging Samuel. Samuel, have the people honor me. Honor me before the people. Because there's this sense he's, he's become addicted and needs. i got to feel significant about who I am. And the only way i found significance is when people give me attaboys. And now he's living for the attaboys. And he's driven to have people, their praise, their affirmation. Nowhere is there a request about what does the Lord want in this situation. Now he's driven by this need to find significance. And he's found something that's helped him with that pain. It's when he got the likes. It's when he got the attaboys. And now here's this man begging, begging, have the people honor me. Have the people honor me. I really sense this is one of the major things that hinder us from following God's presence is this need for the approval of people, the approval of man. And we see it in the life of this man. And I put down addiction to praise, finding his significance here, his sense of worth. Codependency is found in this situation, in this. And I started, as I thought about this, I said, God, who was his father? And I looked it up. He's the son of Kish. He's the son of Kish. And I want you to go again to 1 Samuel chapter 9, 1 through 3. And I just, I just want to look at this. And again, I'm, I'm trying to just follow what I felt like the Lord told me. I think there's some of us here who we never got the affirmation of our fathers. And we're living for the affirmation of people, not for the leadership of the Holy Spirit of the Lord in our life. Because there's a wound there's something that's broken inside of us that Jesus today, the Father, wants to pour into and to heal so that we can honestly no longer feel insecure but be secure in the Father and let the Father lead us. Now, let's look at this, this dad here, uh, Kish, chapter 9, verse 1 through 3. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abil, the son of Zerah, the son of Becherath, Becherath, the son of Aphiah, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than, uh, than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost, and Kish said to his son, Please take one of the servants with you and arise, go and look for the donkeys. And so I, I started looking at this and I said, the son of Ki or Kish, he's a, a, a mighty man of power. So I looked up these words and the word mighty is the word gipor and it can be powerful, but it can also mean tyrant. And the word power is kael and it can mean a force, an army. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm going somewhere with this, and, and I'm not trying to misinterpret Scripture. But as I look at this insecure man, did it flow out of a tyrant father where he never matched up? He was never good enough. And he's always trying to jump through the hoops to please his father, to please daddy, to be good enough. And it brought this incredible insecurity. And then he begins, he's picked to be king, and one of the worst things for an insecure person is to become a leader, honestly, because it, it can eat you up and take you to lunch because then you start living for the praise of people. And that's what happened. He started to have success. He started to have success. 
And then we find in one of the chapters, I think it's 14, he builds a monument to himself. And he's living the fear of man. He's living to please the people. He's living to get their affirmation. Why? Because there's a broken place inside of him that he's looking for. And he finds that as people affirm him, he feels good inside. Temporary, but he feels good inside. God wants to heal that in every one of us in this room. God wants to heal if there's any place within us where we're living for the affirmation of people, and that's really what's driving us. God wants to heal that today. How does that happen? Go with me to Luke chapter 3. What's interesting is you look at Saul and the insecurity, you see such a difference again in David. David's brother comes to him as he's facing Goliath, and says to him, he, he tries to belittle David. He says to David, he says, who's tending those few little sheep that you've got back there? He's, he's trying to belittle David. But David, like, it's like he doesn't, it doesn't move him. It does not move him. Other people at times put pressure on David to conform. To get their praise, to get their affirmation. Ziglag's a perfect example. They're all going to stone him. They're upset. we got to go. But he doesn't just do it to please the people. Because he's, there's a security in him. God wants us secure. That we have one Lord. That we're not driven with all kinds of other voices. But that something has happened in us. To where there's this incredible security that we're okay being us, and it's the Lord that's going to lead us. We just see Saul driven with this, with this need for praise, this need for praise. I remember reading an article, and somebody had sent it to me via email, just even on Facebook and stuff, how we live for the likes. You know, and it's, it can be funny. We can chuckle about that, but underneath, is there something deep? Am I looking for that to help me feel significant, to help me feel good about who I am? If it is, it's a misplaced thing. It's a misplaced thing. Nothing wrong with the likes. But if that's what helps me to feel significant, it's misplaced. We've got to come to the place where this is his voice. What he says is where I find my identity my worth, and my significance. And I'm just talking, but I know I'm talking from a place of where some of us are living. And I'm telling you, I lived too much of my life trying to find significance in people's opinions. Thank God for age. Thank God for the process of the Lord that we can get to a secure place to where honestly and truly we can say, there's one Lord in my life, Jesus Christ. I love people. I love those around me. But I'm secure here. I'm not going to ride this. I'm not going to be led by this and this. I'm secure. And that's when we'll be the most fruitful and the greatest blessing to other people, honestly. Look at Jesus here in Luke chapter 3, 21 and 22. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus was also baptized, and while he prayed, the heaven was opened. I love that, that the heaven was open. Prayer opens the heavens. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son. In you I am well pleased. You are my beloved Son. In you, I'm well pleased. Jesus is getting ready to step into public ministry and, and uh, incredible life of fruitfulness. God does three things here, three things that I think we need. One, he gets the Father's affirmation. Beloved. He secures his identity, your son. And he declares over him, you have favor. Your pleasure, the pleasure of the Father is upon you. 
We need both of those, all three of those things. We need a revelation of the Father's voice speaking to us. You're my beloved. That, that, there, that word there means you're special to me. You're my favorite. To get to a secure place, we have to hear God speak that to us. Not a man speak it to us. But we have to hear the Father's voice speak deep in us. You're my favorite. You're my beloved. I'm telling you, when that happens, something shifts inside of us as human beings. Something shifts inside of us as human beings. We can, the rest of our life, run all over looking for affirmation, but I'm telling you, when you hear the Father speak it, you will never be the same. And God's going to speak it today. It's do we have ears to hear. So I'm going to read something here as we close, and, and, and I pray to God that our ears hear what the Father's saying to us. The second thing, you're a son. It's not a gender issue. It's a relationship issue. You're a son. Go with me to Galatians chapter 4. I hope you hear this from my heart. This is, I love you. I love this body. I don't want to see people living for all kinds of other things than God. So many things causing us not to live in a place of rest, in a place of peace, in this place of shalom, where I, oh, I'm complete. I'm complete. I don't need anything else. I don't have to chase this or chase that. I'm complete. I'm a son. I'm a beloved son. Look at Galatians 4 here. It says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption. That means to be set as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son, into your hearts crying out, Daddy, Daddy. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Therefore, if you, you, therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Identity, identity, you are a son, you are a son, you are an heir of God. Does it say I have to do something? No. By birth, by adoption. Think about adoption. Who makes the choice? The parent chooses the child. Our kids... We didn't have a choice. God chose them. They came out. That's the way it was. We would, have, we would have chosen them. Yes, exactly. But I want you to get the, de the, the, the dearness, I guess. I, I'm trying to think of the word. That's probably not even a word in the vocabulary, but that's the word I'm going to use. The dearness of this word adoption. Michael. God. When he was forming the earth, he looked 6,000 years. And he said, Michael Johnson's going to come forth. He's my son. I choose him as my son. No man chose you, brother. God chose you to be his son. God wants us to hear this deep, that it makes us secure. I can't, I can't kick any kids out. They're, they're my children. You're a son. God chose you. God chose you. Hmm. Adoption. Adoption. The last point here in, in Luke is favor. 
favor, pleasure. You are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. God's favor is on us. God's pleasure. I, I love Zephaniah where it says he dances over me with joy. I love it, Psalms where it says, Ron, drink from the river of his pleasure. And I think about that. I'm thinking, how do I drink from the river of his pleasure? God's the one that has pleasure. He has pleasure in me. And I can drink from the river of his delight in me. Whew. I don't know what that does to you, but that goes all the way through me. That I bring God pleasure and he literally lets me drink from his delight in me. In me. His delight, his pleasure in me. God today at Potter's house wants to so deeply bring revelation to you that you are secure. That you're not chasing all kinds of things to find significance, to find value, and to find worth. But you hear his voice today speaking personally to you. To you. Now what I want to do here and maybe, Nikki, you can come and just softly play on the keys. I'm not going to go any farther than this. I'm, I'm going to read, read something here. And then we're, going to, then we're going to minister. I want you, if you, you can close your eyes, keep your eyes open, whichever way you feel comfortable. I'd like to have you just set your Bible maybe off to the side because I want you just to drink in what I'm just going to read over us today. This is the Father. Some of you maybe have read this. It's the Father's love letter. But I want you to hear these words from the Father. I'm just going to kind of shut all the voices out. This is the Father using my voice but speaking to you and to me. I know everything about you. I know when you sit down and when you rise up. I am familiar with all your ways. Even the very hairs on your head are numbered. You were made in my image. In me you live and move and have your being, for you are my offspring. I knew you even before you were conceived. I chose you when I planned creation. You were not a mistake, for all your days are written in my book. I determined the exact time of your birth, where you would live. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you together in your mother's womb and brought you forth on the day you were born. I've been mis misrepresented by those who don't know me. I am not distant and angry, but am the complete expression of love. And it is my desire to lavish my love on you simply because you are my child and I am your father. I offer you more than your earthly father ever could for I am the perfect father. Every good gift that you receive comes from my hand for I am your provider and I meet all your needs my plan for your future has always been filled with hope because I love you with an everlasting love my thoughts towards you are as countless as the sand on the seashore and I rejoice over you with singing I will never stop doing good to you for you are my treasured possession I desire to establish you with all my heart and all my soul and I want to show you great and marvelous things. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Delight in me, and I will give you the desires of your heart. 
for it is I who gave you those desires. I am able to do more for you than you could possibly imagine, for I am your greatest encourager. I am also the Father who comforts you in all your troubles. When you are brokenhearted, I'm close to you. As a shepherd carries a lamb, I have carried you close to my heart. One day, I will wipe away every tear from your eyes, and I will take away all the pain you have suffered on this earth. I am your Father, and I love you even as I love my Son, Jesus. In Him, my love for you is revealed. He's the exact representation of my being. He came to demonstrate that I am for you, not against you, and to tell you that I am not counting your sins against you. Jesus died so that you and I could be reconciled. His death was the ultimate expression of my love for you. I gave you everything I loved that I might gain your love. If you receive the gift of my son, Jesus, you receive me. And nothing will ever separate you from my love again. Come home, and I'll throw the biggest party heaven has ever seen. I have always been father and will always be father. My question is, will you be my child? I'm waiting for you. Love your dad. Almighty God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. He's going to continue to pray, and I'm going to ask Fred if you would come, Doug if you would, if, you, if you're comfortable, Frank if you would come, is Frank in here? Tom if you would come, Tom uh, Ash. These men are going to come and represent Father. But if you're here and you just sense, man, there's something snapped inside of me. These men are going to be here too. Speak over you words of affirmation and embrace you as a father. As a father. I'll tell you, I know, I know that I know you will receive healing in your soul. We'll have our other teams come, but right now I just I want to zero in on this. The security issue is huge. God wants to heal us, straighten those ways inside. You got a word, honey? Go ahead. When we were in worship earlier today, I, I had a, a vision, and it was someone in this deep pit, and they were trying so hard to climb this ladder out, but they kept losing their grip and sliding back down, and they'd get a ways up and then it'd be missing some steps and it would seem too far and they just kept sliding back down mm -hmm. and they were just sweating with the effort of having tried to get from one place to this other place and suddenly I saw a rope drop down mm -hmm. and they didn't want to let go of the ladder but the rope was their father and he was saying just grab on because I can pull you out and some of you have been trying to overcome anger and a harshness mm. for years. Not understanding it came from this insecurity, from this woundedness, mm. this need for your father's affirmation. Mm. Some of you have struggled wallowing in self-pity, <coughs> negativity, and you've tried so hard to overcome it, and you've tried and tried to climb out, and God's saying, what you need is me. And will you let go of you fixing it all? And will you grab hold of me today? I'm here. I'm here and I won't let you fall. I'm here and I won't let you go. 
I'm here and I can pull you from that place where you've been stuck to the place of freedom you've longed for. Just reach out. Grab hold. May I ask our elders if they'll come forward too, Daniel, if you would, and Prophet Matt, and maybe some of the prophetic team. We're just going to try to follow the Holy Spirit. And if you're here and you want prayer, we're all here to speak into and to minister into this area that God can bring wholeness and healing. Amen. To you. Sense that okay. there's parents who need to go get your kids mm. that you see in your youth or you see in your child this wound or this maybe it's a grandparent who brought their grandchild I don't know I just feel like they need that ministry of the father's love over okay. them today so if that's you and you're just sensing that know that that's welcome here too amen in this moment to minister to them amen amen you're beautiful I saw God look down he sees us as so beautiful. Mm. And we look in the mirror sometimes and we think we're not right. We need to be prettier, more handsome, or <clears throat> have different talents. I wish I had that talent. I wish I had this talent. He, he delights in us mm. the way he made us. And he knows. And some of the things that we think are quirky or so different and even... People in our church family might think, you're really strange. God loves us. He loves that, that difference. He delights in it because somewhere down the road, you're going to be able to reach out to someone else. It's hmm. good, Pat. Amen. He thinks you're beautiful <laughs> right where you're at. What age you are, it's okay. He loves us. He delights in each and every one. You're the apple of his eye. We just need to look up and listen to the words that Pastor Ron said and receive his love. Even the flame, we, we sang the song about fanning the flame, and I just heard a little urgency in his heart, and he said, will you just sit here? And let me fan the flame mm -hmm. to the degree mm -hmm. I want the fire to burn. Amen. Do you Amen. really know what you're asking for? Mm -hmm. Set a while and know me and know what I can do in you. Amen. Because I love you. Amen. Well, if you want prayer, we encourage you to come. Again, Pat hit it again. It's. Saul had everything in the natural where he should have been secure, but he didn't have the voice of the Lord. And that's what we need to hear is the Father's voice. So if you uh, want to come and pray, uh, these folks are here to pray with you. Nikki will lead us. If you need to leave, you're going to be able to be dismissed. And You want to go get your children? Uh, we're here to minister to them. The Father's love, the reality of the Father that will bring healing and restoration.